Dear God, I know that uh, we all had a uh, heavy week and uh, even for the last couple of days where we were fulfilling our responsibilities, we thank you for your sustaining grace upon each one of us. We thank you for the opportunity to again learn tonight. We commit everyone to you who are on their way. We pray that uh, you will uh, help them, keep them safe, and we commit to you our uh, studies tonight. We ask that uh, you will grant us the wisdom that we need so that uh, we can understand and, and, and learn uh, the lesson that uh, we want to uh, learn tonight. We pray for all of these things in Christ's most wonderful name. Amen. Okay. So, Thank you. I know that uh, Brother Ajay needs to leave 7.45, Brother Sam needs to leave 7.30 because he has a oh. uh, training tonight. Okay. We'll get into so it. Let's, let's do our best to get as much as we can. Uh, let, let's finish the delivery because that's where we stopped last time. Uh, we, we really would like to emphasize the importance of... Uh, being able to deliver the sermon in such a way that we're able to communicate effectively. You see, it's one thing to be able to s communicate a sermon. It's another to really try to do your best so that you're able to communicate it effectively. You know, sometimes uh, there are people who are guilty of just trying to win it. And if you're handling the Word of God and the responsibility is so sacred, you cannot just wing it. There's so much accountability in what has been entrusted to you. And, and so you want to really do your best. And, and the way I look at it every time I have the opportunity to preach is that... Uh, I often would think about how many people would be listening to me, and then I try to multiply that with the length of my sermon. And so, for example, I, I, I have around 200 people, and I'm going to preach for 40 minutes, which means, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to speak to 200, you multiply that with 40, then how many all in all? 800. 800. So you're actually 8, wasting 8, 000, you know, around 8,000 minutes mm -hmm. because of the number of people and the number of time that is entrusted to you for that particular sermon. And, and just imagine your accountability you know, before the Lord if you're the preacher and you're, you're given that amount of time and you've wasted everybody's time because you did not prepare. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so it's, it's always important that we have the proper perspective if we're going to approach our responsibility. And we've been talking about delivery and we covered dress and appearance, we covered posture, gesture, uh, and then the eye contact. And this is where we stop. We said that, you know, if you're going to uh, give a sermon, you want to make sure that you have really mastered your material in such a way that it would really give you the freedom to be able to look at people who are listening to you. <clears throat> because if you are you have not mastered your material, then you will always have the tendency to go back and read. And I'm sure you have been exposed to some teachers who are always reading. And uh, not that it's bad to read, but it lessens your effectivity. Okay? Sometimes you want to be accurate, and so you want to read your material, well, it's good, but again, if you're after enhancing
enhancing your uh, communication skill, you know, then you really need to have a good eye contact. Now, and, and let's move to the next, verbal delivery. Now, with verbal delivery, there are certain areas that we really need to emphasize, which when, when we talk about verbal delivery, first, we need to talk about the speed. You know, a regular speed in preaching is about 125 to 190 words per minute. Now, which means you're not allowed to speak very slow. Now, how would you know if you are on the proper rate? It's easy. Now, for someone like me that writes everything that I'm saying, I could literally number how many words and try to time myself in the paragraph, how many words should I be able to cover if I'm going to read it in a certain pace or at a certain speed. And if I'm reading it slower than 125 to 190, which means I should be more conscious of my speed. Or else, you know, it's going to affect my effectivity. Because what can speed do? If you're dragging your sermon, it would literally make people sleepy. Right? By, by trying to speed up a little bit, it, it shows excitement, it allows people to be able to at least uh, engage you in a more uh, passionate manner. Without it, then people would be bored. You know? uh, and so we need to be conscious of our speed. 125 to 190. Speaking should not be rapid enough to show uh, speaking should be rapid enough to show vitality <laughs> and yet slow enough to be certain. So there are two things we need to highlight under that distinct articulation and comprehensibility. Meaning when you're speeding up to the extent when you're not able to distinctly articulate or people can no longer cannot understand you, then you have to slow down a little bit. That's the, that's the reason why 125 to 190 would be a good pace. So once you, once you write your sermon, I would suggest that you try to count the words and then you time yourself. And if you're reading slower than 125 to 190, then you have to pace up a little bit, speed up a little bit. But that would, that would be hard part of it. Yeah. Because I'm, if I will be speaking Tagalog, that 190, but if you're talking it like, in, like translating it, everything in English, that would be... No, when you write your sermon, for example, when you write your sermon, you would know how many words one paragraph is. Oh, you just read it? Yeah, you know, just try to read it. Just read it. You know, just try to read it. Mm -hmm. it. And then you time yourself when you're reading it. Mm -hmm. if, you are, if you're reading it slower than 125 to 100, you try, you see, just like me, I have a manuscript for my sermon, then I could probably count my paragraph mm -hmm. and then <clears throat> try to make sure that by one minute, I have got through at least 125 and over. That's the minimum. Now, that's the minimum speed, 125. Because slower than that, you would be too slow. And chances are, you'd make people speed. Especially on a 45, 30 minutes, 40 minute sermon, you know, if that's your pace, you're going to have problems. 
Okay? And then volume. Notice, not always shouting. There must be variety. Modulation of the voice can be of great help. What do you mean by modulation? Not just adjusting your, mm -hmm. your pitch, but uh, at least trying to, uh, how do we, how do we, you modulate meaning, okay? Well, that's, that's on the tone, but modulation is, you see, there's a difference between, when I speak, uh, let me, let me try to show you what it means. Uh, if I'm reading, for example, with my normal, mm -hmm. you know, I would say a simple lesson is never a sermon lesson until it is shared in the congregation. Okay. By modulation, mm -hmm. it means that you're going to not just have an increased volume, but you're trying to enlarge your your voice. So I would I, I would say. In a modulated tone, I would say a sermon lesson is never uh, a sermon until it is shared to the congregation. So it's more than, in singing it's easy when, when you're talking about modulation because uh, you round your voice in, you, when you modulate. Uh, for example, if I'm singing uh, on a normal <clears throat> way. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. But in modulation, it says, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. So there's a difference between modulation and normal speaking. You see, when you're preaching, modulation can help. But you have to practice. You have to practice. That's the reason why the longer you do the preaching, the better you become. Mm -hmm. If you're not taking responsibility to preach, then you rob yourself of being able to master the, the skill. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and a lot of the times, if your volume is... Uh, soft and it doesn't bring a sense or level as if you're uh, passionate in what you're saying, it's going to come out. And again, people will be bored. You don't have to be shouting. You know, you could just be speaking without shouting, but people can hear you. And I remember uh, when I had my internship at one of the provinces in the Philippines, one of the things that really helped me a lot in, in, in the volume aspect and in the modulation is we did open air preaching. So evangelism, we would just stand on corners of the streets and start preaching. During those times that was still you know, very prominent in the Philippines where uh, we do some sketchboard, or we just put up a stage, preach, and all of a sudden, if you're a thief, those would be the first ones who would be there. People would be curious what you're doing, and people would, you would start attracting people. And, and we did that on a regular basis, and so that helped develop my uh, speaking louder than usual. That's why my, my only problem sometimes if I preach here, even if my mic is not working, you can still be on. I think that my mic is on. Yeah. Um, you know? Okay. First, because I, I speak, yeah, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have a natural, strong voice. So, uh, and, and that's an, always an advantage. But if you're not used to preaching with a certain volume, then you have to improve also your volume. Mm -hmm. Just here to be aware. Yeah. 
at least in our in our church, when we have a good sound system, that means we have even if you're just whispering, you know, people will hear you. And sometimes variety of volume will really help. Sometimes by lowering your tone, people listen listen in mm -hmm. on what you're trying to say. They know that you know you're making an appeal when uh, you're lowering your your volume. So, but volume is so important because again, it helps you in your delivery. Uh, there was a time in the past where preachers were always shouting. And, and that's no longer working today. People get annoyed. I you know? stay away from preachers in the shop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that, but before, you know, that was the mode of preaching. People were shouting. Preachers were shouting. Because the, the model were evangelists as far as preachers were concerned. So people just like uh, Billy Graham, who would have uh, rallies on streets right. or evangelistic meetings on streets. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, you have to speak louder. Imagine during the time of D.L. Moody when they were gathering thousands of people and they didn't have microphones. Mm -hmm. You know? How Spurgeon mm -hmm. in the Metropolitan Tabernacle were preaching to thousands and thousands of people and they did have a uh, sound system during those times. I think the pastors also, they designed the churches. Yeah, with the acoustic. So that, acoustic yeah. And, and if, even if you're far away, they'll be able to hear uh, the speaker. But so Dear Moody was an evangelist. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were preaching in an open air, thousands of people mm -hmm. listening. And so you really need to speak louder. And so they have a tendency to shout. The problem is if you have been preaching for quite some time and you're shouting all the time, you're going to destroy your vocal cords. You're going to strain your voice. That's why you have to learn to modulate, speak louder when you're preaching so that people can hear you, people will understand exactly what you're saying. And not to change your voice. You know? No, not, not change your voice, but at least you're still adding uh, <laughs> volume in a sense that uh, it's like, how do we describe that? It's not your normal speaking voice, yeah. but it's really part yeah. of, the modulation is really part of your delivery. And then, the tone. So avoid being monotone or single tone. Uh, we are familiar with music and we know that there are, you know, uh, you, you cannot stay in one tone because, or a single tone, meaning if I'm going to uh, deliver a sermon, you you want to be able to make sure that there are times where in uh, you you're you're able to deliver it in a variety of tone. Excuse me, Pastor. Some just to call Coletta and he said it's important to pick up the, your phone. You left your phone. Okay. So I'm trying to think of somebody who is monotone. Pastor is considered monotone? Not, not, no, he's not, not, not really, not, not really, but he's 
more softer, and, and, and so it's a little bit different. And and so, but it's not. It's not. <coughs> it's CS Pro. RC Pro. RC <laughs> No, it's not. CS <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. No, it's not. No, no, no. The, the key is variety, you know, the volume, the tone, so those are, and then you need to be able to learn how to provide an emphasis, which means if you have, like, a very important sentence or a very important point, you know, it's possible that you're going to speak louder or Repetition could be a good way to emphasize. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure. I mean, I noticed like what you said in your sermon. You say, "Now, now listen to this." Yeah. Okay? So that's a nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I do that. Yeah. Listen carefully. Yeah, listen carefully. Yeah. You know, so so what's really significant is for you to know your material and what you want to emphasize. So that when you deliver your material, you know exactly when you have to pace up a little bit, speed up, mm -hmm. or when you slow down, when you would like to emphasize, you know. Uh, sometimes when you're just starting to preach, this is not something that you get right away. But the more you do it, then the more you become better at it. But again, the key with a verbal delivery is you need to be watchful of your speed. You don't want to be so slow that you drag the sermon. And then you have to be conscious of the volume. You need to be conscious of the tone and then the emphasis. Now, modes of delivery. This is really significant. There are three modes or ways of delivery. Number one, without notes. Now, this doesn't mean that you are extemporaneous without preparation. Some people think that preaching without notes suggests being extemporaneous and you're winging it as you go along. <laughs> you know, that's not what it means. Preaching without notes is you have prepared well but you have worked well to be able to really master your material. Notice the key three words, saturation, organization, and memorization. So you have studied, but then you have mastered it to the extent wherein you can say that you, or you have at least been saturated with the sermon you're going to give, you have organized it. Now, when, when, when we think of organization, sometimes what is really significant for you to understand is, for example, uh, I have my introduction, okay? And in my introduction, I have, like, four paragraphs, okay? Now, organization simply means that you don't necessarily memorize every word, but you know how you transition from paragraph 1 to paragraph 2 to paragraph 3 to paragraph 4. You know exactly what's the emphasis of your uh, paragraph 1, what's the emphasis in paragraph 2. So you could probably just give yourself one line to remind yourself of the first paragraph. Mm -hmm. You know? And then another reminder for the second paragraph. Another reminder for the third paragraph. 
and then point one. The same, you know, if you have turbulent paragraphs, which means you have organized your sermon to the extent where you know exactly your main emphasis for every paragraph. So that even if you're not going back to your notes, you can literally move from your first paragraph to the second paragraph, to the third paragraph, to the fourth paragraph. That's organization. Okay? And then of course, memorization. Now memorization <laughs> is more extensive it's because it means you really have memorized even the words. And I usually go for the combination of the three. As much as possible, you know, when I'm delivering the sermon, I'm so familiar of my transitions from one paragraph to the next paragraph, but at the same time, I try to familiarize myself with the words so that if I see the, if I remember the first word in that paragraph, I remember almost you know, the other words that's going to come after. Like a key word. Yeah. Yeah. Key word. Yeah. So, so you really need to work that hard if you're going to be preaching without notes. But again, let's not misunderstand without notes as not being prepared. Okay? Because some people... Uh, think that preaching without notes means not preparing well. <laughs> now, next is with manuscript. Preaching with manuscript simply suggests that you write everything you say or you write everything that you want to say in that sermon. So, in terms of this type of preaching, this mode, there are three advantages. Greater precision, deeper sentences, and greater confidence. That's the reason why I want to really write my sermon notes. Because as you write, you can eliminate, you know, some of the ideas which probably are of lesser importance. You can only put the important ones. You know? So, which gives me at least the sense that if I'm able to write the sentence, if I could still tweak it to be more precise in what I'm saying, I don't waste a lot of time. And then I could use the words that I that I really would like to, if I could say it in such a way that there's a deeper way of saying it that people would appreciate the sermon, then you're able to do that if you write a manuscript. Rather than just, you depend on your mind to work while you're preaching. <laughs> Wherein, there are some people who would only write an outline. That's uh, Francis Chan. You know, yeah. and, and they just go. Yeah. The only problem I have with that is that you have a greater tendency to be off time. You stray, you stray topic. Okay. You know, you could be going everywhere. Yeah, that's the only thing. Because you're not preparing. So that idea of greater precision will not be there. Because it's possible that whatever comes to your mind, you know, you would say. Now, oftentimes, there are some preachers who feel that by writing everything, you eliminate the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's the idea of, you know, then you depend on yourself so much that you no longer allow the Holy Spirit to work. I, I really do not believe that because I still believe that the Holy Spirit can work in your 
sermon preparation. So, that as you prepare, the Holy Spirit is already giving you what the Holy Spirit wants to really give to your people or to the people who would be listening to you. And then as you preach, if the Holy Spirit allows you to have some additional idea, then go for it. You know, you're not, even if you have a manuscript, you still have some flexibility. Uh, that's the reason why if I feel I'm spending so much time, I, I'd skip a passage. You know, I'd skip a story. And, and I do that in, in, in my sermons on a Sunday. You know, if you have a manuscript, you, you probably would say, oh, he forgot this particular yeah. passage. But you see, I'm always conscious of the fact that our service is end at 12.30. And I don't want, I, as much as possible, I should be done preaching by 12.15. That's the time I give myself. And so I'm really happy with our new <laughs> clock. Because, it's good. Maybe not, it's good. because the other the other clock, I can't trust. I don't know if it's late or if it's advanced, so I have to look at my watch all the time. But with our new digital watch, Perfect. Is uh, it okay to look at your watch? Well, no it's 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 okay, but uh, it's that's okay. the reason why. That's the reason why. If you notice, if I'm not using this, I always have a big bigger watch that even at a short glance okay. like that, I see I see my time. Uh, it's okay for you. Don't want to make it so obvious. <laughs> that people become more conscious than you are if you see that the time. Right. Because the people listening to you, you know, if they see you looking at time, then they will also look at the time. <laughs> oh, oh, it's lunch. Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? Like, Which means that you're only making people more conscious of time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. the reason why if you can eliminate it, eliminate it. Right. You know? Uh, but at the same time, you, you want to be able to maintain a discipline that you finish on time. I remember when I was teaching, preaching at the seminary, we had, if you're preaching on the chapel hour, once you hear the first bell, you have five more minutes. Oh. Oh, wow. Because there's going to be a second bell, which means the chapel hour is done. Yeah. And the, the finals for all the preaching classes is that you're going to preach during the chapel service where all the professors are there and the entire student body about 300 students will be there and all the professors are there <clears throat> and for that final exam my instruction was once you hear the first bell you have five more minutes if you don't stop by the second bell then I'm going to walk out you're done and you're going to have a big deduction on your sermon. What if you only need it on the second point? <laughs> the first point. <laughs> you have to end. <laughs> you have no choice because it's a chapel hour. Uh -huh. the, you're going to, you cannot keep the students yeah. for that chapel hour because they have, yeah. they have classes after that. What about the yeah. word of God is important? For, 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 for us, <laughs> In the seminary, we have chapel hour, and then we have a break of 20 minutes, and then people go back to class. So that break is for their snacks, for, you know, to wind up a little bit before they go back to their classes. So that's the schedule that we have. And, and it's always good <coughs> if preachers really have a good handle of their time when, when they're preaching. So with the sermon that you're going to write, you have max of 30 minutes. Uh, you have shorter passages, so you need to begin deciding whether you would write a manuscript or do without notes. And last, with minimal notes. With minimal notes would be, again, uh, you could just have an outline, but you 
still have to study it, you know exactly what you want to say, under all of those points. Many preachers, you know, would use this particular method because they don't want to be uh, bounded yeah. with their malices. Yeah. But you really have to determine your level of skill in preaching if you want to be effective on which mode you're going to try. Either number one, is uh, with loud notes and then with manuscript or with minimal notes. Yeah, my, I, I did this one last time I preached. Just condensed it down just for quick glancing. Yeah. I, you know, I, like I took your advice to watch your, just to watch the stream again. And, you know, it's just a quick glance or if yeah. you forget something. Just. Yeah. Well, again, with uh, a manuscript, it doesn't mean that you're going to read every book. Yeah. You can still write uh, your sermon. And unfortunately, if you're going to preach during the chapel, you'll have to write your manuscript. Because uh, we provide everybody with the notes. We email everybody with the notes. Right? So, so that has been uh, our way. If you're preaching somewhere else, then you probably can do the minimal notes. I, I remember my childhood days in church when we used to have guest speakers, and they would come like with the, the whole thing. The whole thing. <laughs> and then the sterling will like looking how many more pages. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, that's uh, a, this is going to be a long one. <laughs> but you see, there are preachers who, even if they have a long sermon, you won't notice it. Yeah. Because they deliver it in such a way that you know uh, they're able to really get your attention. Mm -hmm. They have some variations in the way they do it. So sometimes, if you have listened to good preachers. An hour, let's say 30 minutes, you know, was only spent. But if it's not a good preacher, 30 minutes could kill if the preacher preached for an hour. Right? We all have been exposed to that kind of preachers. So we want to be able to at least uh, have a decision on how we want to approach our our servants. So Pastor, if you're a rookie preacher, is it okay to preach less hour? Because you don't want you know you if you're a rookie preacher, I would suggest you write a rookie. Mm -hmm. You know? And then master it. Because that gives you more confidence. Mm -hmm. If you're if you have mastered, I would really discourage you and reading every day. Mm -hmm. You could glance in your sermon once in a while, but we want to be able to maintain eye contact. Because if you don't engage your your audience, then you will not be invited again. <laughs> <laughs> in, in most cases, you know, you you no love kit. <laughs> Is it okay to do a combination of with manuscript and with minimal notes? Let's say it's just a, what I've done before is I have the manuscript for my own Sorry. purpose, for yeah. my study, and I provided the minimal notes and <coughs> outlines. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, because they have the, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. the PowerPoint, so Power. you supply it to them. Yeah. But with the manuscript, you only have it. For you yourself. yourself. Yeah. So now, for our purposes here, I oftentimes have asked the preachers to be right because I want to be able to read what they're going to say mm -hmm. during the morning worship. And so we try to do our best to filter the sermon to make sure that uh, because. Our worship service is so important. There are people who probably would have the only chance to sit there. Mm -hmm. And if we blew it, then we probably would 
think it's a false doctrine. You know, false doctrine in our worship service. But honestly, that, that's what helped when Pastor and I sat down together in his office and we talked mm -hmm. through it and, and just having the peace to know, oh, Pastor's not calling me every 24 hours mm -hmm. while he's on vacation, you know. Yes, yes. But, but sometimes in the manuscript, I'm tempted to read that. Right? It's okay. When you're, I, I read. Yeah. yeah. Well, but it's still different. Even if you have read it, it's still different when it's being delivered. Yeah. Because now, if you have read it, then you're able to just listen because now you, you're able to, because even if there's a manuscript, usually there would be some additionals, you know. So it, it's still, I'd rather err on more preparation than less preparation. Because for me, more preparation would mean people would benefit from it more. I'm, I'm talking about the part of the listener. Yeah, yeah. I'm, sometimes I read ahead of time. I don't really listen to what the believer anymore. Yeah. So because you already. Yeah. yeah. Now, I just would like to suggest that if the. the Lecture note is robbing you from listening. Yeah. Okay. Then don't read ahead. Yeah. You really have to, to listen in. Uh, I don't think because with the with the sermon notes we made a survey at BCI to remove it because we had so many complaints. Yeah, and the people asked for the sermon notes. So it means that people want it. Yeah. Uh, why did we stop? No, why did no, we stop? No, we stopped doing the sermon notes. Oh, okay. so you know, before we had sermon notes every Sunday. We oh. inserted it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, because it, it's also additional cost on our end. Yeah, yeah, it is. So we remove it and we said, well, you know, people probably would not mind if we remove it. Yeah. It's emailed to them. So, so we remove it. Now we told people, Okay, if you really want the hard copy, then you can ask for the hard copy, so but we can email you the soft copy. Yes. Just to lessen. So we only print around 50, mm -hmm. I think now. 30, 30, we dropped it. We dropped it to 30, more people are relying on the... I don't know, email so I always get... In the morning, yeah, we send them in the morning. Uh, I, I the morning. always get the hard copy. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> When I'm not preaching, I want to have the hard copy because I can follow along. <laughs> you know, when, when Pastor Glenn is preaching or Pastor Steve is preaching, then, and I already read it beforehand, the sermon, but I still would like to have a copy while you're preaching. So, so you just have to uh, at least know what's more advantageous for you and what's not. Preventing you from really listening in because you're reading, then at least you should just adjust. The reason, okay. the reason I, I, I like it, for example, um, when you're going through the points, when, when, when the preacher is going through the points and I have them uh, point one, point two, point three, if I miss something, it helps me go back and, and, and yeah. just have a connection. Real quick, yeah. but not not actually reading what someone is talking. But it just helps yeah. me follow. Yeah. But to be surprised, we have some members who would send my sermons to their pastors back home. In <laughs> 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 so because uh, they want a piece of in the Philippines, resources are really very scarce. Books are expensive because they're coming from the U.S. And so there are a lot of pastors who are not able to buy good materials, good books. And that's really and so some of our some of our members, you know. Uh, I remember when Sister Letty was still alive, uh, she would literally mail the sermons to her sister in Scotland, I think. And so she has a sister who's just starting in Different faith, mm -hmm. and, and she would always gather her sermons and send her sister. And so when the 
sister this this year, she was up to date with all the smartphones <laughs> that uh, we have here at PCI. And so, you know, and in, in so many ways, whatever you have written can also be a blessing beyond the <laughs> hour this year. So, so whatever, whenever you have an opportunity. And then, last year is the length of the lesson. Now, the saturation simply means is that you have saturated yourself with the sermon that you understand. Memorization sometimes is that you, you memorize the words, but your comprehension level with what you're going to say is, it, it is not that deep. But in saturation, aside from memorization, you know, you really have understood your your sermon. Okay. You know, you have saturated yourself with your sermon. And then, Pastor, are there times like when you preach, when you feel like you have to say something which is not, which is not, it's like a thought that came to you at that time. Yeah. Have there been times that, okay. Just like, uh, if you still remember, Last Sunday, there was a part in my sermon where I talked about inclining your ears and I added the Hebrew idea, the picture of, you know, you bending over to read and listen. That's not in my sermon notes because I read that after I'd written the sermon. So I just have to add it. You know, so... Which means you still have some flexibility even if you have written what you wanted to say. Mm -hmm. If there are some new things that had happened, you know. Okay. There, there, there were also, I think, there were at least twice in my time here when I felt that Sunday that was not the right message. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And so I have to scratch the sermon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Oh, that you're almost done? Or? No, it was already finished. Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I felt that what I had written there is not the right sermon uh, for that it? particular Sunday because something was going on. Mm. You know? So, what and so, I preached another sermon. That you have prepared prior well, before, or you. God led me to a passage. And then I preach on that passage without the preparation that I needed. So we can I, do I, that I, I, just, I just feel that that's yes. the sermon, that particular sermon. But you are uh, so familiar with that. Well, I've been, I've been, a, I've been, a, <laughs> I've been a pastor <laughs> in the <laughs> South <laughs> 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 This so is a big, so big, 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 so, <laughs> so that there's a, there's a big difference. If, if I probably would just in my several few years of ministry, I probably would be saying I didn't do that. Yeah. But with the stack knowledge that you have through the years, yeah. 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 But even then, I don't do that on a regular basis. It's very rare. So for my almost 23 years. I'll be on my 23rd year in July here in BCI. Uh, only I think I do this twice. In Garfield or here? Here. Really? I think one, at one point here. And then one it's here. not a series though. No. No. So no, it was a series. And I told people that I'm not using the same notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I remember that. Yeah. yeah. I think I remember too. Yeah. Yeah. I think I did that at least twice throughout my life. And, and I think something was going on during that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. I think you're, you're so... Oh, uh, maybe at the time of Jimmy? Was it Jimmy? Well, the time of Jimmy was really different. I was not the assigned preacher. It was Norm. I came yeah, home... Yeah, but you you? I came home Friday, mm -hmm. late Friday night. And then... Uh, that Saturday, I got a message from Norm mm -hmm. that he doesn't feel he can yeah. Challenge for that because of the suicide of Judy. And so 
So I said, no problem. So I had to do the sermon. But I still wrote the sermon notes overnight. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So, yeah. you know, that, that would be really by grace. Mm-hmm. But that was, and, and I, I'm glad I, I did it. Mm-hmm. Because if it was for me, instead yeah. of doing it, I don't think. There's 